Well, hello there, Pilgrim. You know what we haven't done in a long time? A good old-fashioned Christian debunking. A counter-apologetic. So let's fix that. So there's a blog that's fairly active on the atheist and atheism hashtags on Twitter. They're not really engaging very much. And it's called the Hillbilly Logician. Well, he's half right. This latest blog is What If Atheism Was True? And I'll link to it below. But here's uh, the start of the preamble. I'll spare you all of it. But uh, here's the start. What if atheism were true? Many proponents of this worldview have possibly never considered their view to its logical conclusions. Many atheists, agnostics, and self-professed skeptics view life as static, which is to say, in the here and now. What happened before is history, something to be studied and used now, while on the other hand, the future is something to imagine, conceive, and plan for as part of the knowledge of now. Really, in the supposed billions of years old universe, as some estimate, is the lifespan of 50, 75, or even 100 years, even of any significance at all? Hardly. We are blips in the cosmic dust, blowing along the trail of this universe's spiral to ultimate nothingness. And he goes on like this for a while, but then he addresses particular topics, which I will address. But let's start with this, the frame for the whole thing. If you're an old hand at this kind of stuff in the same way that I unfortunately am, you'll notice a couple of glaring problems right from the get-go. I mean, the question, what if atheism were true? And atheism isn't uh, a contention, really, it's just the rejection of your suggestion that a god exists. It's a, it's a demand for evidence, it's a call <laughs> for evidence. God is real, show me. You can't, so we don't believe it. It's it's not really a, a, a proposition of its own, which is why the burden of proof does not fall upon the atheist. It falls upon the person making the claim, which is the Christian saying God exists. So immediately there's a problem there. Secondly, it's not a worldview. Uh, an ideology, a religion, some philosophies, and some of these can be said to be worldviews, and atheism can be a part of a worldview, but atheism itself, in and of itself, is not a worldview. If you imagine a worldview as being a, a cake that is made up by your moral and ethical stances, things you believe, all that kind of thing, then atheism is flour. It's not the cake as a whole, it's just an ingredient that may or may not form part of a worldview. So that's all completely wrong. And the rest of what he's talking about is really not to do with atheism. I mean, atheism is often a result of people's understanding of biology and time and physics and all the rest of it because it contradicts the Bible. But your beef there, mate, that seems to be with science. Uh, with reality, with external reality, insofar as we can make out what's true about it. Not with atheism. But uh, let's move on to some of the other things that he talks about, because they're a bit more meaty. The first subject he touches upon is justice. He claims that without God, the idea of justice vanishes. Well, let's put it in his words rather than mine. First, the idea of justice vanishes. Vindications for the wrongs of the world we live in are non-existent. Values and morals are not objective and truly unaccounted for in the grand scheme of things. Hitler will not be punished for his war on the Jews and many other groups. There will be no reconciling the past wrongs or punishment for the ills of the world. The tyrants of old, the butchers of yesteryear and the criminals of the past are just dead and just as dead as the good, the right and the just. And of course those are illusions. Justice is not going to prevail. It won't. There is no final courtroom, no final charge to answer to, or punishment to mete out. Life is meaningless in the grand scheme of things. For what purpose do we exist? And worse, is there ever a reckoning of past wrongs which seem to have gone unpunished? Justice is purely an illusion, if atheism is true. Well, there's a number of problems here. <laughs> Uh, first of all, is a fallacy which I haven't been able to find a, a real-life corollary to, 
But in the book Anathem, it's known as Deax's Rake. And basically what it means is, just because you want something to be true, doesn't mean that it is. That you want there to be some apre v justice court whereupon your lives are weighed, balanced, measured, and the evil are punished, and the good are elevated, and so on. Just because you want that to be true, doesn't make it true, no matter how much you wish it were true. I might wish I was laying on a beach somewhere getting blowjobs from half a dozen pretty young women. It's just, it, I'm not, no matter how much I wish that was so, it is not going to happen. And so it is with God and heaven and all the rest of it. So justice, you know, we still have hope for justice, but we have hope for justice in this world. Here we can punish people, here we can reform people, here we can remember and elevate and honour the good people, and here we can punish and forget and so on, or, or recall the misdeeds of the bad people. Now these morals are relative, but we have a, a certain common baseline due to our evolutionary ancestry in very, very, very very broad and non-inclusive terms, uh, you could say that that is that altruism and cooperation are good, uh, selfishness and cheating are bad. That's about as broad as you can get. And then contexts and civilizations and comfort and wealth and so on all make a difference. If someone steals a loaf of bread purely to spite the baker, that's, that's one thing. If someone steals a loaf of bread to feed their family, that's another. There's, there is no black and white when it comes to morality, when it comes to ethics. Everything is an individual case. Yeah, we can make certain broad demands, but these always have to constantly be interpreted and checked and so on. You're not appealing to an objective standard of justice either. All you've done is you've taken an off-the-peg system and you're adhering to that for some reason. But just because you believe something to be true need something to be true, want something to be true, doesn't mean that it is. Then there's some specific problems. Now I'm going to assume, probably safely, that as a, a hillbilly Christian apologist, yeah, you're Christian. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. But consider this. The God that you profess to exist does not just punish people for being bad. He doesn't just punish the Hitlers. In hell, Hitler would be alongside, say, Gandhi. Okay, he's not the saint that he's pictured as being, but you know, it's just for, for the sake of uh, a comparison. You know, someone who is thought of as a good person would be in hell right alongside Hitler because he didn't believe in the right magic man in the sky. That's not just. Also, any transgression that we do in life, if we assume that your God exists, will result into Christian theology in infinite punishment. You are in hell forever being tortured for all eternity. Which means that is automatically not just. It wouldn't matter if you genocided six million people or whatever it happens to be. An infinite amount of punishment will always outstrip any finite amount of, of damage or sin we could ever do. So the God that you propose to exist is inherently unjust anyway. But there's no reason to think it exists and your wishing it were so isn't going to make it so either. The next topic he touches on is that of hope. Hope vanishes in the light of the truth that atheism presents. What could we hope for if the world is random chance and pure luck? No grieving mother who is despondent, depressed, and mourning the loss of a baby, a young adult in battle, or the spouse of fifty years, could hope to see their face, hear their voice, or be with the love that existed in a particular point of time. Hope is an expectation of a future event which will be better than the present. Atheism offers no support for hope, offers no reason to ultimately hope in anything, but extinguished existences of all life and matter itself, or at least the forms as they exist now. Hope is illusory not to be trusted and grasped. If atheism is true, life truly is random chance, atoms bounding off hopeless items and affecting other hopeless entities. What is hope but sheer fantasy of expectations that are grounded ultimately in nothing, worse than brains in vats, if atheism is true? Of what use 
is false hope. If you are lying in a bed with cancer, say, and for your own good, the doctor decides to lie to you and say that you don't have cancer, doesn't put you through chemo, doesn't put you through anything else, sends you off home, happy as Larry, not a care in the world, wouldn't you rather be told the truth? Right action, uh, to borrow a term from Buddhism, can only follow from right knowledge. So, if you want to deal with the world as it is, as we all ultimately have to, you have to recognize the world for what it is and the truth of what it is. A comforting lie is in the long run worse than useless, worse than the truth, because you can't make your life better, you can't grasp for hope, you can't aim for a better outcome if you don't deal with the world as it really is. So, and I feel I'm going to be re repeating myself a lot here. <laughs> but just because you want something to be true doesn't mean that it is. That you want for there to be a heaven, that you want for you to see your loved ones. All, all of this, it, that doesn't make it true. Just as wishing for anything else doesn't make it true. When we all fear death, that's an evolutionary byproduct. Of course we fear death because we want to live, we want to reproduce, we want to raise our young, and if we're dead we can't do any of that. Any creatures that didn't have self-preservation would have died out. The basic fundamental of evolution. Things that succeed, survive. Things that don't, die. So of course we don't want to die, to the extent that we will even deny the existence of death. But to deal with reality, we have to accept and understand that one day we all die. It, it happens. Now this lends value to life, it doesn't take away from it. In your creed, you talk about an infinity of bliss or whatever after this life. And as you've pointed out yourself, compared to infinity, what does our finite lifespan mean? Well, in your context, not very much at all, <laughs> other than, you know, you're aiming for this life afterwards. This is the same thing that enables suicide bombers and, and so forth. They, they believe that they will be rewarded in this afterlife. They're lied to. And you're rooted in exactly the same kind of rejection of reality, rejection of the here and now, rejection of this one life we certainly appear to get for the sake of an imaginary other one that comes afterwards. It is the very finite nature of life that lends it value and meaning. If you study even basic economics, you'll know the laws of supply and demand. Well, we get a very limited supply of life, and we all very much want it. Limited supply, great demand, high value. It's not that difficult to grasp. And again, just because you want something to be true, doesn't mean that it is. Atheism is not a worldview or a truth claim. It's just not accepting your claim. Death. What about death for atheism, if true? Christ's death at Calvary was useless. His resurrection a creation of fantasy and fiction. Death is victorious. Death does reign, and it conquers and destroys all. Our moon, sun, stars, and yes, planet, and the entire universe will succumb to death. There was not a payment for sin at the cross in Israel some 2,000 years ago. Death took an itinerant Jewish rabbi to a cruel measure of demise for no apparent reason. To suffer and die as his message meant nothing. Atheism is grounded in the nothingness of hopelessness and death. Death is not positive or negative, it is neutral. Death just happens. It comes, it takes, and it never frees a soul from a wretched body. Souls surely don't exist either. Death is the reality, the ultimate reality, if atheists are right. Yet again, I must point out that simply because you want something to be true doesn't mean that it is, and that atheism is not a worldview. It doesn't make these assertions that you're claiming. Uh, well, let's assume, just, just for sake of argument, that when he says atheist, he means the kind of sceptical, rational atheist. Because you know, all of these claims that he's making about souls, and Jesus, and all the rest of it, succumb to even the slightest amount of scepticism. Uh, Jesus, uh, for example, 
if Christianity had not had a stranglehold on uh, Western culture for, for you know, well over a thousand years, if that had not happened, Jesus would be held in the same standing as Zeus or Thor or King Arthur. It would be considered to be uh, you know, pure mythology. It, it, is, has, it holds a privileged stance in, in history and theology and so on, simply because it has had this stranglehold on Western culture, not because it's valid, not because Jesus has any historicity, there is zero evidence that he ever existed. So Christianity has been uh, privileged, <laughs> much as I am loath to use that word because it gets misused so much, but it has been privileged not to be held to the same standard as other theologies and mythologies in the West. But the, but the good news is, if, if Jesus didn't exist, and if your proposition is wrong, which would be the atheistic position, that you're wrong about God, the, the good news is that there's no sin either, no uh, mythological disease of which you just happen to, to have the cure on offer for, roll up, roll up, enjoy my snake oil. You know, so that, that's out, out of the window. Yeah, things, things die, the universe winds down, entropy is a son of a bitch. And the only way we can ever hope, even faintly, to conquer any of these things is to actually deal with reality as it is. Perhaps we can engineer our telomeres so they don't degrade. Perhaps we can learn to upload our minds into some computational substrate of reality. Who knows? But these are things that have actual hope to them. Maybe we can upload our consciousness. Maybe we can replace our bodies and live forever. Maybe we can reverse entropy in some dim and distant future we can't yet fathom. But we won't do any of that if we settle for the mythology of a band of Bronze Age goat herders. It's just not going to happen. So again, you have to deal with reality as it is to have any hope and it is the finite nature of reality and the reality of death that lends our lives and our actions value and purpose in our own human context our masterful hillbilly logician goes on the next topic being god god does not exist if atheism is true so we know nothing from him and nothing of his son's grace it is a fictional account embellished to appeal to the uneducated uninformed and clueless masses that see divine intervention in everyday instances the bible is a collection of fables and proverbs as relevant as any other book or stories of yore it isn't god's word no it is truly just men Brilliant indeed, but blinded by religious devotion or purely hallucinatory notions, visions of angels, spirits and gods as real as fairies, unicorns and the lucky charms leprechaun. Religion is a fantasy, made to make us feel better about the eventual extinguishing of our existence. Maybe we are that vat or the brain, imagining a world of hope, eternal life and God. Yeah, if atheism is true, we have no greater good. Well... Finally, he almost gets the wording right. It should be, so if Christianity is false rather than if atheism is true. That, yeah, that's the way it should be worded, but, but still. And again, even when it comes to, to God or similar ideas, just because you want it to be true doesn't mean that it is. But I don't think in this passage he's really uh, talking about God, because that kind of gets tied up in everything else. Rather, I think we're seeing a hint of what the real problem is. He can't abide the idea of a life that doesn't have assigned meaning. And I use that terminology specifically because meaning is something that we as conscious entities assign to things. Different people experience meaning in different ways or assign different meaning to different things. People read different meaning into things. So we're capable of providing meaning, we're capable of creating our own meaning. If in order for your life to have meaning you rely on an irrational, unevidenced belief in a god, then your life must be pretty poor as things stand. There are plenty of things to draw meaning from. Friends, family, work, art, music, all manner of things that we can invest meaning into. 
yeah, it's it's subjective. Yeah, there is no external arbiter or provider of meaning. So, uh, the advantage of that is that we get to define our own meaning, our own raison d'etre, our own lives. And that's a huge, great and wonderful feeling. And as to a, a greater good, what about the greater good of humanity, of our family, of our community, of our species, of our planet? And there, there's greater meaning for you, you just have to grasp it. Our hillbilly's next topic is beauty. Beauty is most assuredly on the death row of atheism's worldview, if true. Beauty can be appreciated by atheists. In the Christian worldview, I'm actually sure. Beauty has no basis if there is no ultimate foundation for it. Beauty is a description and quality that exists in the Christian worldview, originating from God. God created all things, originally, in a way that was beautiful. And it is clearly affected by sin now, but much of the beautiful qualities are retained if the Christian worldview is true. If the atheistic worldview is true, then beauty is truly in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? What would be the place to ground beauty standards in? It suddenly becomes a subjective standard that can change with the whims of the viewer. Beauty can't be appreciated in an objective way, if atheism is true. Beauty, like morality, is subjective, and it's more obviously subjective, I, I think, even than morality or ethics are. I think it's much easier to understand that our appreciation for aesthetics differ when you start to describe what you find beautiful. You may find the arrangement of a Schubert symphony to be beautiful, while I might appreciate the intricate high-speed fingerwork of a speed metal guitar solo, for example. You may find the poetry and writings of Edgar Allan Poe or H.P. Lovecraft to be lurid, I find them beautiful. I have no time for literary fiction, because it does, it tells no story, it goes nowhere. I have no appreciation for it, it means nothing to me. Uh, people's likes and appreciations when it comes to art, music, film, television, yeah, you, you name it, they differ enormously. But there are some qualities that we can say are almost universal. There's experiments that have been done asking people to not, not to write words, but to draw them, and harsh sounding words with lots of <laughs> type sounds and so on. People all over the world draw as spikes, whereas more rounded words, like round, for example, people describe using a circle, or a soft and squishy form for the most part. So there are common aesthetics across humanity you know that's subjective too but it's broad across all of humanity you know there are certain standards like waist to hip ratio facial symmetry and so on that we tend to find beautiful and there are patterns in nature a result of nature following the fibonacci sequence or the golden ratio that cultures tend to find beautiful and then there's the kind of slight distortions that we can also find beautiful or interesting, the Japanese concept of wabi-sabi, for example. But it's obvious that it is subjective, and what few objective measures we can point to are indications of health and symmetry. You know, all living things, all living cells divide, so you inevitably end up with symmetry, usually bilateral, sometimes even bigger. But these are things that we see as beautiful because we have evolved to see them as beautiful, to recognize a well-formed mate or a, a good place to stay with water and that's calm and relaxing, things like that. This is what beauty is. It doesn't require some external god force to assign it meaning. We can assign it subjective, contextual meaning ourselves. And just because something is subjective doesn't mean it isn't true, it just doesn't mean it's real in an objective sense. The next topic is what he calls the boundary effect, which is the last thing he covers. The last thing I will consider, if atheism were true, is boundaries. Rules, regulations, laws, or whatever you want to call them. I'm not talking about morals, even though there's an element of boundaries in morals, but in a larger universal sense. If atheism is true, there would be no boundaries, no standard, and no way to measure anything. 
God is a ruler in the kingdom sense, but a measurement ruler too. By him we measure all things, truth, standards, and anything else you can think of. Let me illustrate with the most mundane anecdotal illustration that I can think of. It is true, so it carries much greater weight. I lived in Cincinnati for a year while I completed my degree in mortuary science. In travelling between my apartment and the college, I encountered numerous stoplights along the route. One late fall day, while most of the leaves were still on the trees, a freak ice slash snowstorm struck. It was very mild, and it was a very brief storm, but the leaves and the snow, sleet, ice combined for havoc on the power lines citywide. As a country boy in the big city, the prospect of driving through a city with no power to control or run the stoplights had me nearly panicked. My fears were quickly dissolved as the journey to school was uneventful, as at every stoplight, everyone, to much the surprise of me, treated each stoplightless intersection like a four-way stop. Each driver proceeded at their turn, with everyone being courteous, considerate and orderly. To the atheistic worldview, this situation proves that morals are a social construct. By necessity, we do the moral thing. I saw it much different. I saw the boundaries of life, the things that we appeal to, ultimately at work. We followed a law, a rule, a boundary, which no one forced us to use. No police officer was at any intersection that I passed through. Each person, without exception, and there was none, but the lawbreaker is still breaking a boundary, followed a prescribed boundary code that no one saw, voted on, or had passed down to them. Something else kicked in, the boundary effect, as I've coined it. Simply stated, the boundary effect is the idea that, intuitively, we have certain boundaries that exist in our very being, which are universal in our collective awareness. We know where these boundaries are, and the boundaries dictate our movement. Yet, if atheism were true, the boundaries seem useless. Human beings exist at a kind of crossover point. In some ways, we're more like insects, eusocial insects, such as ants or bees or so on. We, we can cooperate on a large and massive scale. On the other side, we are capable of being remarkably individualist and remarkably selfish. So we're, we're somewhere between the two, and each person varies in their commitment to the whole or their commitment to the self. But even so, we've evolved certain ideas through evolutionary psychology. Like I basically phrased it earlier, that can be put as altruism, good, selfishness, bad. Apes, monkeys, are close relatives in the evolutionary tree of life. They also hate cheats. Uh, they also getting less than each other. They will punish members of the troop who doesn't share what they have. They uh, get outraged by it. Even other animals that are social animals like dogs and wolves and even rats will react in similar kinds of ways. So it's easy to see an evolutionary basis both for the idea of altruism, of being nice and good and generous to each other, and of the punishment of those who transgress these unwritten rules. In the circumstance that he describes, everyone has a common goal. They want to get where they're going safely. They also face a common problem that the stoplights are out. They're used to certain rules at four-way stops and so on, and so they naturally default to them. But this is created by the culture and the situation. The morality, the ethics, the rules of the situation are both situational and cultural. They've all learned to drive in the same way, so this behaviour emerges. And I'm sure there were plenty of people that weren't doing it properly, just as there are people who run red lights, because humanity runs the gamut between the generous and the selfish, the altruistic and the individualistic. So little surprise, there's no need for a god to impose this, just evolution and culture. It's a remarkable, wonderful thing, and all without needing to resort to a god. He ends on a what if. I'm sure there are atheists that find meaning in life. They see a value in doing something, contributing and or finding ways to pull meaning out of their existence. I'm not sure I could. I'm not sure if atheism is true. I could be loosed from the despondency, hopelessness and doom that life is leading to. I look at life now as hopeful, beautiful and wonderful. An atheistic worldview robs hope, beauty and wonder from our hearts and minds. We spin in a universe ultimately, eventually, and inevitably doomed for destruction and death. Yes, death. The only true eternal force of nature, if atheism is true. 
Yet I am reminded of that verse, 1 Corinthians 15.55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? In the atheistic worldview, this is not a true statement, for death ultimately triumphs over all. If atheism were true. See, I don't, I don't think that's true. I think you are capable of finding your own meaning in life. How can I say that with any certainty? Because you already have. Because your Christianity is just a set of fables, it's just a set of stories. It's an off-the-peg worldview rather than an a la carte one. It's one that doesn't comport with reality, of course, but it's still ultimately self-selected, at least in a pluralistic and modern society where fortunately you can't be stoned to death for believing in the wrong Sky Daddy anymore. Now, it is refreshing to see some old-fashioned Christian apologetics because these days what we tend to find as, as atheists and why atheist channels aren't as popular as they used to be, what we tend to find is ranting morons like Dean Esme or a retreat into esoteric philosophy as you might find from William Lane Craig. It's still intellectually impoverished if you actually go and examine what he's saying but you know they hide or we find simpletons uh, freshly onto the internet from places like Africa giving us the old why well, there's still monkeys and so on it's hardly worth engaging but but here okay you call yourself the hillbilly logician but the basic problem throughout all of these is the same one just because you want these things to be true doesn't mean that they are. Now that can provide you motivation to try and find out if they're true, but that has to be an honest investigation and it has to involve evidence. You're making other fallacies besides wanting it to be true, such as appeals to consequences and so on, but these consequences don't hold. I mean, the most law-abiding, peaceful, you know, the highest scoring on the Human Development Index countries tend to be the, the most atheist countries. That's organic atheism, that's where the atheism is arrived at without being imposed, of course, but then that's not a problem with atheism, that's a problem with communism. <laughs> Very different things. If there's one thing I would like you to take away from this, assuming you turn up and watch it because it's addressing you directly, but this goes out to other Christians as well, you need to understand what atheism is and isn't. It's not a worldview. It's not a claim. None of these things. It's just the rejection of your claim that God exists. That's it. You're constantly conflating it with other things, and if you want to argue on those other things, then by all means we can do that. I'm happy to argue science, though I have a very limited understanding of it. I'm happy to argue philosophy, even though I think philosophy is almost as useless as religion. And you can argue logic. I'm quite happy to do, to do that. But these are different topics. All atheism is, is when you say, God exists, we say, I don't believe you. And that is it. Atheism is to be absent belief in God. That's all. Nothing else. Zang.